Welcome to Private Equity Profits. Clifford Locks is a certified board of director, a trusted confidant to CEOs, C-level exec, and high potential employees to help them clarify goals, unlock their potential, and create actionable strategic plans. Seth Green is the nation's foremost authority on growing your portfolio companies with direct response marketing. He is the founder of the direct response marketing firm, Market Domination LLC. And he is an eight-time best-selling author who has been interviewed on NBC, CBS, Forbes Inc., CBS Money Watch, and many more. Cliff and Seth interview top players in the financial sector, focusing on private equity firms, venture capital companies, and family offices, discussing developments and trends shaping the industry. These experts will share with you how they've grown their businesses and increased profit, and how you can too. And now, here's your host, Cliff Locks. Welcome to the Private Equities Profits Podcast. I'm Cliff Locks, your host. And with me today is Patricia Lizaragua, the managing partner of Hypatia Capital a private equity firm focused on sponsoring female CEOs in both growth equity and buyout transaction. Patricia, thank you so much for being here today. I'm excited to have you on. Thanks for having me, Cliff. Thanks for this opportunity. Sure. So um, as, as you said, I'm on the board of the largest financial services company in Peru, and that's because I'm actually Peruvian. So that's where I grew up. And uh, I was very fortunate to have the most wonderful professor in college, a man, man needs no introduction, Dave Swenson. And I was actually in his first, the first lecture class he ever gave on investing. It was really the only investing class uh, at Yale at the time, and I think it still is. And it was a big lecture. And I took the class and he was so engaging and funny and smart. And I think he was 29 at the time and I thought so old, but um, old and wise. But one of the things he, he said is, you know, what I'd like you guys, I was a junior, he said, I'd like everybody to read the newspaper every day and, and the Wall Street Journal, which at that time was just finance. By the end of the semester, by the end of the year, you'll know what part of finance you find the most exciting because you will automatically get attracted to the articles that are about that corner of finance. And I urge you to pursue that avenue because it clearly will be a natural interest. Followed his advice. I ordered the, the student, the discounted student Wall Street Journal and uh, started reading. And what always really attracted me were the M&A transactions and the buyout transactions. And so I looked for a job in that area immediately after college. And then after business school, mm-hmm. Um, I was recruited by DLJ, which, which you know, was this wonderful combination of M&A and, and private equity, and that's how I got started. Very good. A lot of passion. It's interesting how a professor can have such a positive impact, and it carries through your career. It's happened to myself, and I hear it from my colleagues, how influential individuals help them find their vibrantness within them. They bring out the best in us and help us shape our future and what it looks like. But you know, We have to take full responsibility for ourselves. It's impactful, so mentoring is important. What makes your firm different than other firms in this space? If we talk about the the private equity space or pretty much any space in, um, in finance, what makes us special is that we are really focused on investing in women in leadership. Mm -hmm. I have been convinced for all of since, since I, since high school that it's more, one gets better results if there are more voices at the table. And not only do you get better results, but maybe more importantly, the DLJ motto is, are you having fun? And I believe that balanced leadership teams and balanced groups in general are more fun than the ones that aren't, right? So um, I think about 20 years into my career, I really realized I, as I got more senior, as I was in a managing director role and, and, and running teams, I said, you know, I want this senior experience to be balanced. I want to have a balanced roster of clients, a mm-hmm. balanced roster of colleagues, a balanced roster of investors. I don't want to tell the story of I'm the only woman in the room that so many senior women tell at all these events that now, um, you know, are very common to have, to have a to have events that are about women in business. And often the most senior person is, oh, I was the only woman in the room or I was always the only woman in the room. And I did not want that. That's uh, So we created a firm that was all about investing in women in leadership so there would be more balance. And that's what makes us different. 
Why are there so few CEOs and how can we create additional opportunities? So the pipeline issue is one that has been uh, studied quite a bit at the academic level. And I think there's numerous studies that are, are really clear that there is quite a bit of bias in the selection process. Mm-hmm. And especially at the higher, the higher you go on the pyramid, the more implicit bias that exists, right? So in order for there to be more female CEOs, there has to be a widening of the balance higher up, higher mm-hmm. up in, that, in that selection pyramid. But by the same token, because there is this unconscious bias and the women who do make it to be CEOs mm-hmm. are actually way above average above average CEOs, right? Okay. By definition, if okay. you think about it. So I think that right now, Hypatia is you know, soon to launch an index that, that shows really that at least public company women CEOs considerably outperform the benchmark, which is 96% male. I think that we need that data to be clearer so that people say, oh, let me look at the female as a potential CEO because she's probably going to be do, doing better than the men. Now, I don't think, I'm not saying that women are better than men. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying right now the bar is higher for women. So if you follow that, that if, you, if you believe that the bar is higher for women, and I think most people, mm-hmm. feminists or not, believe that, mm-hmm. um, then that will take you to the natural conclusion that that the women that are selected right now are going to be out performers. So if you can invest in that, you're going to make more money than if you don't invest. It's a good analysis. And you got the data to back it up. We have the data. It's going to, it'll be published by the end of the year. I think it'll, yeah, it'll really, uh, we, we have already pop, we already have published the Hypatia Women Hedge Fund Index powered by Wilshire. It's mm-hmm. on the Wilshire website okay. and it takes uh, women who, so, so the, the criteria be in this index is that you are a, the portfolio manager or the chief investment officer, mm-hmm. or if you're the CEO, that you own at least 50% of the company and that you have $100 million AUM, right? Which is a going concern size for hedge funds. And in the index, there was a third consideration, which was uh, quarterly liquidity, which, which took out a bunch of really amazingly well-performing hedge funds managed by women. And even though we have taken out those liquid, uh, those more liquid uh, opportunities, the benchmark, you know, the index still outperforms the industry benchmark by over two hundred points since inception. And and the women and the women's CEO index is going to double up. Very exciting. Thank you for sharing that. That's insightful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just to finish, I think once people start seeing that data, easier way that might be a better way to attract the capital. I agree with you. The data presented eloquently with a real story resonates with people to help them listen. It's an important story that needs to be told. And I think it's important to bring forth. And I'm proud of you and your firm as you continue to take the leadership position. Our major financial papers and news programs, social media, I think they'll cover it and will go viral. Well, hopefully it'll get go viral right as we launch the ETF that's going to go with that. All right, you got timing. <laughs> be very positive. I'm very interested in your insights. Crunchbase, the leading destination for companies' insights for early stage startups in the Fortune 1000. There are only 3,374 female founders listed out of 675,000 companies in the database. Interesting. It really parallels what you're sharing at this point. Right. Uh, Well, there, there um, there is the unfortunate truth that it is very, very difficult for women to raise capital. Okay. And I think, therefore, uh, that percentage is much lower than what I believe is the amount of uh, startups that, um, that are founded by women or women teams. Mm-hmm. But the fact that they're not in crunch base means they haven't raised any money. So I think, the, and, and, it's, and I just unfortunately think that right now, there is an unconscious bias towards uh, allocating capital to people like oneself. You know, I was sitting next to a young man, not that much, a little bit younger than me, and, 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 and kind of same 
same educational pedigree and similar work experiences. And, and it was really interesting because he said, oh yeah, you know, we have this idea and it really is just a thought that somebody gave us a couple of million dollars to figure it out. Mm -hmm. It was just to me interesting to talk to a man who had been fundraising for, you know, this, this, this seed or very early stage funding and contrast so dramatically with the dozens and dozens of women that reach out to me that are finding it extremely difficult to find anything other than a couple hundred thousand dollars it's of friends sweet. and family. Yeah, and sweet. so that's, that's, you know, that's the, that's the reality of what's going on. Now there's shout out, shout outs to, to, to firms like Portfolia, who should, you should, who, I don't know if you've um, had a podcast with, but you definitely should with I Trish can. or with Golden Seeds, but, but that really are putting their money where their mouth is in terms of trying to really get more seed capital, early stage capital to women investors, women teams, companies focused on women, because if not, we're going to stay with those numbers that, that, that crunch base throws off. It's interesting. I was reading an excellent article, 50 female entrepreneurs, everyone should know. It's an article out of crunch base. It's easy to find it. Just Google it. 50 female entrepreneurs, everyone should know. Some of the women founders are just starting their entrepreneurial journey, while others have raised over $800 million in funding. Like you, many female founders champion women, and their solutions are addressing problems commonly overlooked by the male community. They're all paving the way for women in tech. I think there's really, really good positive message. There's many of these founders at this point have raised $30 million, $40 million, and have been successful. I just don't think the story has been told at this point. I mean, yes, there are many. But they're very few compared to right. that. Well, I right? only gave so you for, 50 there, and that's, so that's for the, a high end. For, yeah. for every, for those 50, yep. there's 460 men oh. who got the same amount of capital. Oh. It's, it's not that they're, and that's in a way why I founded Hypatia, mm -hmm. because at, you know, 15 years ago, the word on the street was that there's no women, there's no women, there's no women. But in, why aren't there more women on, on boards? Well, there's no women executives, but I actually went and counted yeah. how many women executives there were in the Fortune 1000. Mm -hmm. And there were multiples amount of the amount of clients that I actually had, right? So I said, even though it's a very small percentage, the number is large and I'm going to go out and meet them. And I did, but it, it goes to that article. Yes, of course, there's 50 women who have raised capital that we should meet. But when you contrast it with the 450, it, it, it's really illustrative of the, of the issue that we're facing. Very, very positive. Very, very positive, Patricia. Is it the universities at this point where we need to have that conversation? Where do we need to start? A little earlier, elementary, middle school, high school? Meaning the entrepreneurial spirit, talking about finance and how business is actually done, how things move in an ecosystem and at this point, how important capitalism is. Where do we need to live with that conversation at this point to bring more women into the running businesses? Running yeah, I mean, this is this is just yeah. so not this is this is so not not scientific. What I'm going to say, but I think there's something to it. I don't think there's any shortage of little girls starting lemonade stands. Okay, that's good. If you look at the lemonade stands in your beach community, I think it's mainly girls. So there's the spirits there when they're little. Something something happens between age 10 and age 22 makes women not go into finance or women not think of themselves as CEOs. And that's why I do think this is a, high, a, a junior high school plus phenomenon. Now, I don't think I don't think we have a problem in elementary school. And there's studies that show that women do just as well as the girls do just as well as the boys, if not better mm -hmm. at math until about, you know, until about middle school. So I think that there's something going on there that, that, that needs to, that needs to be further researched by, uh, by academics and, and, and sociologists and, and see what we can do to make, um, to make the idea of being a leader in the workforce more attractive to women. I agree with you. 
I was looking at some other data, the graduating female found. So who last raised funding between August 2019 and August 2020? And they graduated from these schools, but the numbers are not large. Stanford only had 93 students, Harvard had 89, MIT had 74, US Berkeley had 52, Penn had 51, Columbia had 43, NYU was 25, Cornell had 25, Yale was 24, and UCLA was 21 students. These are very small numbers. So I think, what do we bring forth in a very, very important conversation that can help shape and improve the dynamics that are in place? You know, I have my own personal bias. I think women are brighter. I think they have excellent intuition. I think men have to listen more. I think sitting on the board of directors of multiple companies, it's a privilege to have women being part of the conversation and encourage them to feel confident to ask questions. It's an ecosystem. There's a balance and more voices at the table. It creates a positive environment where you can actually accomplish a great deal at this point, but you have to give them the space to speak up and really embrace their views because they are bright, extremely bright. Patricia, you've done some very strategic marketing at this point. Are you working with the very and the ultra high net worth individuals and the family offices, or are you just going out to the funds? We definitely uh, reach out to uh, family offices. As you know, mm -hmm. it's very hard to reach family offices, and mm -hmm. each one is a world unto itself. Mm -hmm. And we have, you know, they're building relationships with, with some of the family offices that are held by the most successful women in the United States. And we're still trying to reach others. And, and so we, we are looking at that. We're also looking at the, the institutional investor community that has interest in balance, but really hasn't found a way to do it, mm -hmm. hasn't found a way to allocate. So we're, we're continually building those relationships and trying to bring them to see the world with the way we see it, which is that actually in investing in it, if there is an investable index of women, that's how they should do it because it reduces the risk and it, it, it allows them to allocate large amounts and make a difference. And we're also you know, very interested in, in our products and talking to the, to the wealth management platforms because I think that women investors mm -hmm. do want alternatives of placing their money to be managed um, in a gender balanced way and perhaps um, will be really attracted to uh, investment opportunity that are funds managed by women or companies managed by women, right? I think it's a way of putting, putting money where your mouth is. Mm -hmm. And if you want to invest in that manner, your, your opportunities are, are not zero. There's quite a few actually. Right. Uh, product out there. And, and like I said, you know, portfolio is one that, that I absolutely love. I obviously am a, a big fan of the ETFs, she and Will and Women. Well, Will is actually an ETM, but she and PAX and, and uh, Fidelity finally came out with one. And I think mm -hmm. that, that they're a great product, but I think that we are going to, I think that, that there's a way to make the story more direct and that's what we're going for. It really dovetails very nicely in regards to the changing funding environment. Are there certain industries or sectors were you more active at this point? At this point, we are very much focused on creating product for women, for investors that care about gender balance. Okay. And so from that point of view, we're more product driven and we're, we're, we're less uh, sector focused than we Excellent. have been in previous years where the sector focus was really an outflow of who is in our network. So we, we had a you know, good look at a lot of consumer, a lot of healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, places where you find more female CEOs. However, right now, we just are focused on, on women leaders and getting mm -hmm. them, getting society to realize how well they perform and how everybody's losing money by not putting more money behind um, the product that invests in women leadership that's out there. Thank you for sharing that. What do you see the biggest challenges going forward? I think that the challenges, the, the world's, liquid and it's going to continue to be very liquid and there but there's also this you know this incredible uh energy today around i think meme stocks and around uh crypto issues mm -hmm. that are that are they're speculative in nature and there is a place for that yes and i think that there's a place for innovation and speculation but i also think that it crowds out a little bit the message of that your retirement and 401k is 
probably shouldn't be in any large part special speculative issues. And therefore, if we're going to go back to basics and basic, you know, fundamentals of what factor outperforms mm -hmm. that we need to, you know, the, the excitement of these two trends that I mentioned, I think might take away a little bit of the thunder of the, uh, of the female CEO outperformance because compared, you know, even though 500 basis points is a lot, when you see what's going on in, in the speculative side, it, it, it definitely crowds out the space. I'm on the board of an NFT crypto company. It is speculative. I, There's no question. It's speculative and, and that's great. No I mean, there is definitely a place for, right. for, for that. But I think that's where a lot of the attention is going. And, um, and so I think that that might be, that might be harder for, more traditional right. uh, investment theses to to get the airtime that, that they probably should be getting. It can be volatile. And you know, I understand not everybody wants it in their portfolio compared to steady, consistent financial returns, which can help ensure you sleep well at night. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. What trends do you see affecting the capital markets in the future at this point? I, I think the the I think the active beta is where the world's going to. I think that the idea that you can ice that you can isolate a factor mm -hmm. without isolating a security is something that is going to become more and more attractive going forward and i don't think there's real data that active i mean i think that, that there's there's some there's some question about whether the fees that are charged by active managers are um going to survive in the long term okay that's a challenge so so I think that uh, we believe that. So we're definitely getting in the index creation mode. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and as long as we can think of a way to create product to make it invest. Very, very positive. So if you think about, uh, about the possibility of more, yeah, I think that's where the flows are going to go into. I, I think the ETF craze is going to continue. I think the active beta ETF craze is going to continue to, mm -hmm. to grow and, um, and evolve. That's one of the trends I think I think I see. I think the, the ability to go public is going to be easier and easier. You know, I think we had a, a, some time when the public markets were losing ground to private equity and private equity was, uh, you know, just, Sweeping eating in. up all sweeping yeah. in and taking yeah. all the companies private. I think that has balanced out now with, uh, with, with the stack uh, craze. And I think that the stacks are going to under, undergo uh, modifications. I think there's many right. people in the financial community that are working on improvements to make it somewhere that's not exactly as, as, as cowboy-esque as the stacks, but also not mm -hmm. as difficult as the IPO from a speed and cost perspective. You That's know you're brilliant, happen. don't you? You got no, your finger right on the I, pulse. I, I, I work with some SPACs. The investors get to look at the investment and do have the ability to pull their money back out before they fully commit. But you get a first look. That's the interesting part. I think the public markets are going to, are going to, continue to be a very attractive very alternative good. to, and I think that the trend that we see in terms of innovation and mm -hmm. innovation is going to continue. So there's going to continue right. to be a huge startup and early stage appetite out in the world. And that appetite is going to be looking to be able to become public so that they can reach a, a retail crowd and continue to, to, to demand scale. these super high valuations and scale, et cetera. So I think it's a, I'm pretty bullish on, on where this is all going. It's exciting times. I'm not sure how high inflation and taxes are going to go. I'm assuming both are going up at this point. It's going to have an impact on us as the investors. Let's see how it shakes out in the 2020 and 24 election cycle. I think most people don't understand the level of taxes that are needed to support the EU programs on the social side. It's a financial hit in around the 60% range. So you right. Know, you know, so the United States has never seen something like that. Yeah. I think our listeners need to talk to their financial and tax advisors now. Speaking to your firm is another positive step to help understand the needs to protect the family's wealth. Intelligent conversations that guide you with actionable steps to be prepared for what's coming down the pipe. Let me ask you a question. What would be your personal legacy and what do you love about what you do? Well, what I, I love about what I do is that 
I always thought that, or maybe it's something my mother or father may have said to me, if you don't like the way things are, it's within you to change it. Oh, I love that. So I love the fact that I don't like, I didn't like hmm. being in an office where nine and a half out of 10 managing directors were guys. Okay. It just, that didn't feel good to me. And I said, okay, let's, can, how would you change that? How would you make that different? What's in your possibilities to make that different? And I took the risk. I had some capital and I said, okay, I'm going to work on that. That's what I want to see change. Obviously the whole world has to change for that to change, but being able to be a part of that process mm -hmm. that is trying to figure out, okay, why isn't this working? And what can I do in my little part of contribution to society to make that better for myself and others that's that drives me i think that I, it being able to see the world you want to live in and work toward that is is what drives me and i think that i look back it doesn't matter if what we've tried to do is successful or not it's the fact that we try to do it that's creating change it's, it's us trying to do it and many many other people trying to do it in their own way and so I, that's something that, that I feel very um, happy about that I've been, that I was able to participate in, in that. Right. This is very positive. I'm glad you're passionate about it. And it's a good message, helping to ensure it's profitable for your clients, socially responsible. The clients must find it easy to appreciate what you're doing. It's growing more. I think your timing is just magnificent. And I think the financial TV programs, newspapers, plus the social media will embrace what you're doing. I know you're coming out with some research later in the year, and I think the industry is going to really want to listen to your message you're sharing and the data to support it. Absolutely. It's taken us a while to be able to be at the right mm -hmm. moment to build this product. It's a product and it's investable and it's an ETF. Anybody can, so, mm -hmm. so I think that there ha we have to have more ways to make everybody able to participate. Excellent. In each podcast, I'd like to share with our listeners, we have a fiduciary responsibility to create paid internships, co-ops, and summer jobs to provide a vibrant learning opportunity for our youth. I consistently hear from my colleagues, this is a wonderful recruiting tool. These programs provide an opportunity to hire a known and to mentor them into talented executives. The best leaders are great teachers. Please consider increasing the amount of women you invite to participate in these paid internships. Each of us can make a positive contribution and change the lives of our young people for the better. And personally, it feels great. Patricia, thank you so much for spending the time with us and sharing your story. The work you're doing to empower women is wonderful. And I wish you continued success going forward. And I'll share your web address. Hypatia Capital, which is spelled H-Y-P-A-T-I-A-C-A-P-I-T-A-L.com. Again, that's H-Y-P-A-T-I-A-C-A-P-I-T-A-L.com. Patricia, would you like to share your contact information with our listeners? Sure. It's patricia.lizaraga at hypatiacapital.com. I'd love to get emails. I respond to all of them and, uh, and try to be as helpful as I can when people are asking me for, for advice or connections on, on whatever it might be. And, I reach out to a lot of people for uh, advice and connections. So I try to reciprocate when people reach out to me. Thank you for that. Thank you to our listeners. I look forward to being back with you shortly for another episode of the Private Equities Profits Podcast. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC.